Okay, here's a problem that, in my opinion, every single student that is taking mathematics, anything at least above like algebra one, we need to make sure that we know how to solve for x. Now there's a lot of applications as far as finding the x-intercepts and graphing, but I believe just the understanding of using your inverse operations to solve for x is critically important for a problem like this. And whenever what happens when we're solving equations, a lot of times once we get into literal equations where we're dealing with more than one variable, students get stuck. So what I always like to offer as my advice when dealing with a problem like this is forget about actually the fractions, forget about the variables. Let's just kind of focus on what do we know? What is it that we do remember? Because sometimes we'll forget things and it can be a little bit more you know, daunting to kind of look at it. So let's go and write up a new equation. Okay, so here is something that looks very, very similar to what I did over here. But I have some nice little numbers here, right? So I like that. Now, when we're solving for x, or if you had a problem like this and we wanted to solve for x, remember what we need to do is identify what operations are being applied to the x. Now, the reason why I put a square around that is my kind of version of teaching this is what I like to call pinning the x. And what I mean by pinning the x is I am not gonna move that x at all that X is gonna stay exactly there, right? You can think of the box as like a stamp, like boom, it's right there. So now what we need to do is identify what is being applied to the X. Well, I have multiplication and I have subtraction. But remember, unlike the order of operations, when we're solving an equation, we use the reverse order of operations, right? So instead of doing multiplication, division, then addition and subtraction, we're now going to undo addition and subtraction first, then we're gonna undo multiplication and division. So you can see my x is being subtracted by four, so I'm going to add a four to both sides. Now, before I get moving on for this one, let's go and take a look over at this equation. I can do the same thing with my x, right? I can pin it. Now I recognize here, I say, all right, what operations are being applied? I have multiplication and I have subtraction. See how I just use easy numbers to like understand what I'm doing, do something that maybe look more difficult with an x and a y and a fraction? So now I say, well, all right, I'm subtracting and multiplication. I have to undo subtraction first, right? So therefore I'm gonna add a four to both sides. Now over here, when I added a four, I get a 12. But over here, I have a y, which is an unknown, we don't know the value of y, plus four. So since I can't define that um, as an actual like number like 12 here, I'm just going to write it as the expression y plus four. I'm still gonna have here a two thirds x. Okay, so now let's do the next thing. Here I have two divided by x. I'm sorry, two multiplied by x. But however, I need to undo multiplication. I'm going to divide by two. Now you can see two divided by two, that gives you a one, so there's four my coefficient. Just make sure you use the properties of equality. Whatever you do on one side, you have to do on the other side. 12 divided by two is going to be a six. Over here, I'm gonna have a one, but I don't really need to write that. And guess what, my x has been pinned. Notice how I didn't do anything with the x and it has stayed there right on the right-hand side. If you wanna write it on the left-hand side, then just go ahead and flip things around. But I like this method for not just basic problems of solving equations, but for ones that sometimes are more advanced where it gets a little bit difficult with so many things going on. Now here, a lot of times students will get stuck because they're like, well, all right, I know how to divide by two. That was an easy, that was an easy question, Mr. McLogan. What about a fraction? How do you divide by those? Well, that's a good question. So first of all, we can still do the same thing, right? Well, actually, you know what? I'm gonna stop right there. I'm actually going to approach this a different way. See, when I divided these twos, they divided out, right? And what that did is that left us with a one. So our whole goal here is to get a one um, as our coefficient of x. Because once we get our one as a coefficient of x, we can say that the x has now been isolated. So you can divide by two thirds, and I'm actually gonna show you, I will. I'll get to that in just a second. But I also want you to think about this maybe a different way. What do I need to do to be able to get this coefficient to be one, right? Now, you can think about division, right? And, and if you think about division in this room, that's probably the best way to think about it. But you can also use the mode of multiplication here. And the reason why I like multiplication is because it's something we learned earlier that is maybe sometimes a little bit easier for students to understand. And that is the idea of the reciprocal. See, when I have a and I multiply by one over a, that gives me an a over a, which equal to one. When I have a a over b times a b over a, that equals an a times b divided by b times a, which is just gonna also equal one. So what this is, is when you take a number or a fraction and you multiply it by its reciprocal, you're gonna get one. So what that means is, I could divide by two thirds, right? Or you can also multiply by the reciprocal. And then some of you might already recognize, because maybe your teacher has already grained this into you, dividing by fractions is the same thing as multiplying by a reciprocal. So therefore now I have three halves times a y over four. Now again, make sure here, here's a big, big mistake students will make. 
they see how I put parentheses around the three halves, right? Because I want to show that I'm multiplying them. Make sure you put parentheses around this expression. Because over here, you just had one number. Over here, we have an expression. We're not just multiplying the 3 halves times y. We're multiplying the 3 halves times a y plus a 4. Now, you could distribute that and leave them separated, or you could just leave this as one um, full expression here. Um, a lot of times what I'll do is we'll just distribute the 3, but then leave the 2 as the denominator. So therefore, I'll have a 3y plus 12 divided by 2, right? Um, and that's going to equal to my x. Now, a lot of times I like the factored out version, so we'll probably just, you know, this is a fine answer as well. Um, but, um, or you could actually separate that um, even further. I don't know why I did it like that. Let's, play, let's do another, another answer from there. Then you could divide those two into both examples. So you have a three y halves plus 12 divided by two is going to be a six equals x. That's another variation of that. Now, because I'm a teacher, I also wanna go through this. What if I don't really understand what I was doing? <laughs> with the multiplying by the reciprocal. What if you're like, but Mr. McClellan, why can't you multiply by the, or divide by a fraction? You can. But again, in this case, guys, you see we have a y over four divided by two thirds, right? So again, if we want to get this to be a one in the fraction, right, these already divide out, so that's easy. But again, what you're going to want to do is multiply by three halves on the top and bottom. Now my fraction is um, divided, and guess what? I'm at the exact same point that I was over there. So that is just another way to approach the exact same problem. But ladies and gentlemen, solving for x on an equation that's in standard form or general form is so incredibly important. So hopefully everybody understands this and this video gave you some value. If it did, then I expect to see you in the next video. Cheers.